getting to, to to know Branford and Jeff Tate and Watts and stuff, and all of them basically had kind of like the same root. Branford is is encyclopedic on on like seventies rock, and you know knows all. Yes, Jeff Tate Watts was a total like fusion rock. And, and so, you know, it's not that strange when when, when I met them. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, everybody knows, you know, Joey Calderazzo knows all of this. He was more into the prog rock thing. Here is what Branford Marcellus has to say about today's guest, Eric Rivas. I love this quote. Branford states, Eric's sound is the sound of doom. Big, thick, percussive. So for somebody whose sound is the sound of doom, Eric is one of the nicest guys I've ever met. I'm Jason Heath. This is Contrabass Conversations, and we are chatting with the wonderful, brilliant, talented, double bassist, composer, Eric Rivas. I'm so glad to have Eric on the show. And in addition to his longtime collaboration with Branford Marcellus, he's been playing with him since 1997. He has played with so many legends in the jazz world, from Betty Carter, Kurt Rosenwinkel, Lionel Hampton to McCoy Tyner, so many other great artists. And he has released four albums as a band leader. We'll be hearing a little bit from Eric in this episode, throughout this episode, a little bit of a tune called Lulu's Back in Town, which is from Tales of the Stuttering Mime. Now, Eric and I talk about so many great topics, super fun conversation. We dig into life living in California. I'm here in San Francisco. He is in LA and grew up for much of his life in France. Fresno, also Texas for a bit. We get into that. His path through the music world and how he came to the double bass, like so many of us, electric bass and funk and all that kind of great stuff and how those influences, and you heard that in the opening quote, how those influences fed into not only his musical language, but that of Branford Marcellus and all his other collaborators. Eric is a fantastic artist. What a cool musician and person, and I just know you're going to love this conversation. We have some great sponsors for today's episode, Upton Bass String Instrument Company, and by the way, Eric is playing on an Upton Travel Bass these days for much of his work, and D'Addario String. So thank you to both of you, and let's dive into this episode with Eric Rivas. Is New York home base for you these days? No, actually, I'm I'm in Los Angeles. Oh, you're in you're in LA. Okay, I did I did did my 13 years in in New York. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, um, I moved to Texas briefly, and then out, out to Los Angeles. Nice, nice. I'm here in I'm here in San Francisco, which is a fun town to be. I'm sure you played SF jazz in the past. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the the last time we did it was, must have been about six seven months ago now with uh, Arwan Ortiz. We did. Okay. Uh, we did something there. I think it's such a cool venue. What a nice, you know, I, before, I'm, I've only lived here a couple of years. Before this, I lived in Chicago for a long time. And I lived like two blocks from the Jazz Showcase. Like what a cool right. place to live, right? So I like, you know, just like my after dinner routine would be just like go up and catch a show. Um, right. But but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty great that they've got that here. Do they have something similar in Los Angeles? Is there a, like a sort of cultural place that jazz happens like that? Or? Oh. Okay. <laughs> It'd be great if they did. No, you know, I I haven't, I can't say that I've been like really ensconced in the LA scene since I've been there. I've been fortunate enough to, to, you know, travel so much, but no, something like that, you know, the the SF jazz thing, or even maybe like jazz and Lincoln center, those kind of institutions, they they would be great in LA. I think San Francisco may be a little more conducive to it. LA is not really a jazz town. Yeah. yeah, for sure. Yeah, I find LA fascinating. Like, so I head down to LA maybe once every couple months, and it's fun. Like, San Francisco is an easier place to just love right off the bat because, like, you right. land, it's like, oh, there's the bridge and there's the mountains and there's the ocean right, right. and the sea, right? right? And you go to LA, but I like. I mean, I've, I've I've had such a great time and just sort of seeing how it's it's almost like becoming a more interesting city. Like, like oh, as definitely. the years go on, you know, yeah. and like once you 
find what there is that, you know, it's like it's charms don't reveal themselves maybe quite as quickly, but it's, right. I've just had a fascinating time in like classical bass is sort of more my scene in terms of playing. So like right. talking to the guys in the LA Phil and like Disney hall and just like what's happening, uh, you know, and even just like downtown LA itself, like it's amazing. That, that place is just like oh. transforming like crazy. It's 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 really pretty amazing. Like I, I was born in LA and lived there until I don't know maybe like I was five or six. Then my family moved to Fresno. Okay. So I, I grew up in, in in Fresno, and coincidentally, we moved back to LA. I went to um, my junior year in high school. I was in LA. I went to LA High, and from that point on, I was like, I I would never live in LA. You know, I was just, <laughs> I, and I can't. Damn this damn place, you know, even though family there, all this stuff is just like, there's no way. And as a turn of events, what happened, you know, um, my girlfriend who became my wife and my daughter, it's just like, we all said, okay, no, we're going to go. And I just, I was just kind of like, oh, okay, let's see. But it's, it's really transformed a lot. Not only, like you said, um, the, the downtown thing, there's been a revitalization uh, and a cool one. It's not just like a commerce thing. It's like yeah. all these art galleries and, and all this kind of stuff. But I, I think also that the influx of a lot of people from the, the East Coast, my wife is from the East Coast, all these friends that we have are out there. And I think it's it's done something to kind of alter, you know, what was the DNA of the place. It's, it's just cooler, man. You know, I know a lot of musicians that, that have, have moved out and the only thing it would be great if if there were like something that you know th- there is kind of a place called the blue well but you know somewhere where we could kind of more coalesce and it'd be more this you know la is just la is not really a town it's a series of things that have just kind of morphed into like this behemoth you know so right yeah it's kind of like a sao, sao paulo or something like you know just in terms of the scope it's exactly. like so so hard to even wrap i mean like downtown LA I mean it's amazing what's happening but like if you think of that in the scope of like the 17 million people or whatever live down there I mean it's just like yeah and then you got Glendale as its own thing with its own performing arts center and and so you went to high school or at least part of high school in Fresno yeah yeah. Wow. What was what was that switch like? I mean, I've been I've driven through Fresno a couple of times playing some gigs. That must have been a that must have been a <laughs> change. It's a great place to be from. You know, yeah. it's like um, my dad actually ended up, you know, living to moving back there. And so, uh, you know, I'm always going up to visit him and stuff. You know, so it's, it's kind of weird. It's, it's like, you know, there, there's all this this kind of like ingrained nostalgia about mm-hmm. it you know they go back it's like oh i remember this i remember this and th- that lasts about three days and then it's <laughs> like wow wow <laughs> but it's cool you know good people it's i think that you know if, if you're if you're predisposed to any kind of like artistic endeavor being in fresno although it's you know a little town in the middle of the central valley farmland all this stuff but you do have kind of a vicarious access to los angeles and to san francisco Mm-hmm. So I remember growing up and being exposed to a lot of stuff that was, you know, considered underground at the time. But, you know, there was there were pockets of people who were like, oh, yeah, check this out. Check this out. You know, yeah. so it's, it's, it was it was pretty interesting, you know, yeah. for for a small town. It's it's um, I think the mix of people and, the, and it being right there in the thoroughfare between San Francisco and Los Angeles. It it, it was cool. Oh, for sure. I wouldn't want to do it again. But. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it's like, let's, let's not go that far. But uh, yeah, no, it was, it was all right. Well, it's funny, like, like you know, in, in the scope of California, it is a small town, but compared to any other state, Fresno, I mean, it's like several hundred thousand people. That'd be like the, the <laughs> yeah. biggest town in Iowa or, you know, another like couple dozen states. Exactly. Exactly. It's, uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's cool. I, you know, I hope to, to at some point kind of, reconnect along those lines and, and, and maybe do some work up there or, you know, um, just do something to kind of give because it, it needs it, you know, I mean, everywhere needs it at this point, but, um, uh, that's something that's kind of on my radar a little.
little bit. Nice. That, there's, a, there's a bass teacher. He teaches at Indiana University named Bruce Bransby. His wife runs, I think she's in charge in some capacity of the youth orchestra program in Fresno. And so Bruce, this guy, he's like 72 years old. Every week, he like leaves on a Thursday, drives to Indianapolis, hops a plane, flies to, I don't know, I'm sure you can't fly direct from Indianapolis to Fresno. Right? It's, yeah, it's, 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 not, it's not a hot spot. So, yeah. He's going through somewhere, Dallas or some Phoenix or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, just like what, what a, what a crazy haul. And, and so, so did you, so then you finish off high school in, in, in Los Angeles. I actually, I actually finished high school in San Antonio, Texas. Okay. Okay. My junior year in LA. Okay. And then I went to live with, with, with my grandparents who were in the uh, base in San Antonio. When did the, when did the base come into your life? Was that high school, middle school? When did that happen for you? What, what has become kind of like a comedy. I started on electric bass, started yeah. on guitar, you know, and then was fascinated by electric bass through just, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> so because of course there, there was no electric bass in, in anything to do with band in the eighth, ninth grade or something like that. So I, I went uh, the, the low brass route. So baritone horn, trombone, tuba. So, and, uh, all the while playing electric bass. And it wasn't until actually my senior year, being in San Antonio, there were some musicians that, that had graduated from the school, uh, Sam Houston High, and a couple of them were going to Southern University. And Southern was, um, it, it was known for their jazz department, albeit very low key. The, the great Alvin Baptiste was teaching there. So these guys would come back to San Antonio and they were like, oh, man, you got to get into, you know, you have to start checking this stuff out. You have to start checking this stuff. And guys like Wes Anderson, he was friends with one of the guys. So it was right around the, the latter part of my senior year in high school. That's when I, I started really kind of getting exposed to the double bass. And it, I didn't make the switch. You know, I, I <laughs> reluctantly, I was like, no, no, but this is, you know, this kind of thing. Right. So... When I when I graduated, I actually I went to Southern for about a semester or something. Then I I moved back to to San Antonio, went to a couple schools around there, and got a job um, playing at the Holiday Inn on the Riverwalk. All right, six nights a week, and that that was that was uh, an electric bass gig. But there was a guy that was was playing. He was playing guitar and keyboards. And he had done some some pretty extensive travel, especially for somebody from San Antonio in Japan and was was a tremendous jazz fan. So, you know, I'm the young guy and he's like and he started feeding me all these these records, you know, and he was like really encouraging me to, to transcribe solos and stuff like this. And I was doing it. And, and in the process of doing that on electric bass, I, it really, you know, the, the, the double bass kind of took over. I was like, wait a minute. What is this dude doing? You know, wow, it, it, it really hit me. And sometimes you're too young to, to really know any, to know that you're, you know, stupid, you know. So <laughs> it when it hit, it hit it hit pretty hard. And then from there, it just got, kind of went full force. What were you, so you've got that like classic, like both of those streams are like that, like the brass player and then the bass player. That's like the original combination, right? It's like low brass, yeah, like tuba yeah. and bass. And then the, also the other is like electric bass and you sort of like fall into the double bass world and like fall in love with it. I mean, what were you into on the electric? Were you into like funk? Or, I mean, I see you, you got your parliament shirt on, which is awesome. You know, was that your, was that your jam on electric? That was my thing. You know, um, the, the other thing that, that was cool, and this kind of goes back to Fresno, you know, being that it's strangely cosmopolitan, you know, because we had no, we had one station that, you know, was kind of like an R&B station. And would play stuff like that, but you know they, uh, I think they were based in Fowler or something like this. So you know, at six o'clock when the sun went down, the station ended. You know, <laughs> so so you know, I mean, I grew up on on FM radio. You know, I was born in '67, so FM radio was was like, and so we were exposed to just like all of this stuff. So even though I had like a certain you know affinity and stuff for you know, the Earth, Wind & Fire, Parliament, all this, and, and was really checking that out later on, like through like Prince and all that stuff that was in the early 80s. There was also all this other stuff, you know, it's like, uh, you know, Rush 
what's happening. You know, I was getting into yes, and then the, the, the whole there were all these these really interesting electric bass players that were happening in the early English scene. You know, yeah. the bands like you know one hit wonder sometimes like Kajagugu had had a killing bass player. The the pan Japan with uh, Mick Karn. So, you know, I'm all of this stuff is kind of coming in and, and, and intertwining. So, you know, like I said, you know, like the telltale sign of a good electric bass player back when when I was coming up, it's like you could play Glide by the, the, the band Pleasure and you could play YYZ. Mm, mm-hmm. if you had those two. You were the shit. You could. <laughs> oh, wow. You can really play. You can't. Didn't know any, you know, it's like, but yeah. those were, the, uh, you know, so. Man, YYZ, why, 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 you're taking me back. I played in a Rush cover band in high school. That was like my thing. <laughs> I remember YYZ, you know, like yeah, you know, all yeah. that stuff. You know, I think sometimes, because I was like, I, I was totally electric bass, heavy metal. My first band was Toxic Death. And we played like these, punk, you know, yeah, very like, you know, okay. and I sometimes think, and now I like what I do mostly is classical. And I think like. Did that affect me at all? You know, like that, or like the way I approached the bass. I think it did. You know, oh, did, yeah. did, like has that? Do you think that's affected like the way? Because like you know, I mean, I listen to like albums you've put out. You know, in the, all the various capacities, leader right. and sideman, and like uh, the first thing I don't, I don't think of Y Y Z immediately when I <laughs> when I hear you play. But but I'm sure it's affected you, right? Oh, totally, totally. It, yeah, I, I think I think the attitude wise, just just being like ha- having exposure to all that and really being into all of these things. It broadens your palate kind of um, subconsciously. You're, you're, you know, you're always like, oh, what is that? What is that? So, you know, rather than getting pigeonholed and, and I only like this or I only check that out. And then also, I think that, um, you know, then starting to get into like Black Flag and, and that kind of the, the hardcore scene that was happening there. And that thinking about it, it, it really did kind of affect the, the way, you know, just just that the, the, the emphasis on like a real visceral type thing so yeah i i, I think it, it totally the, ironically is so fast forward and you know getting to to, to know branford and jeff tate watts and stuff and all of them basically had kind of like the same root branford is is encyclopedic on on like 70s rock and you know knows all yes all like you know jeff tate watts was a total like fusion rock and, and so, you know, it's not that strange when, when, when I met them. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, everybody knows, you know, Joey Calderazzo knows all of this. He was more into the the, the, the prog rock thing, you know, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, that's so fa- that's fascinating that you guys were all sort of like like feeding off that same pool of mute and like what an amazing what an amazing time just for like rock and fusion and funk and just that whole development. It's so cool that that sort of like was like an or- it's it's like what you've been up to. It's kind of like an organic outshoot out of that. That's yeah. that's, fan- yeah. that's fantastic. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Well, it's, it's always fascinating for me to like look back and think like where that came from. I mean, man, talk about a time of change. You know, you look at like 1964 to 1974 or something like that. And just like what was I, happening musically. And I mean, you couldn't imagine like talk about radical. I mean, it's got to be one of the fastest periods of transformation in, in without a doubt. popular music. Yeah. Wow. And, 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 and everybody and the, there was a, a kind of a mindset of of everything being accepted. You know, there, there wasn't it, it, it wasn't people weren't as pigeonholed or, you know, like as, as one dimensional as they seemingly have become in a lot of ways in terms of pop music. So, I mean, driving down the street, you would hear like, you know, this, you know, Elton John followed by the Ohio players followed by. I, I think that that inadvertently we, we all start seeing like, you know, what is good and good translates throughout these, you know, these different roads. And so it's like the quality becomes the thing, you know? Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, I, I agree though, that that period of time, that 10 or 15 years is just, it's, it's amazing. It's, mm-hmm. it's really, really amazing in terms of, of that. And it's kind of a period where like a lot of people would say like, you know, I mean, there are lots of period where people are like the death of jazz or the decline of jazz. Well, you know, it's like it's like I mean, that's like one of those periods people apply to that. Right. It's like, oh, we had right. the 50s and the 60s. And then what happened? You know, everything. What what do you think happened? You know, asking you to speculate on these like big questions. But like, when did that pigeon holding start to happen? Like, because I, I start to think of, of jazz. I, I sort of see the separation happening, like in the in the early 90s or the 80s or whatever. Like, like what what brought that about? Do you think? Was it the record companies or was it the venues or? I, I, I think I think you, you had you had kind of like um, not, not a toxic, but you, you had all of the elements for the perfect storm of something like that happening. Yeah, I think there was like, yeah, I, I think that, that when 
record companies started realizing that that they could profit probably more out of streamlining things or or you know just just beginning like we are going to do adult radio mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know and and that means that we're going to put all these resources in there and we're just going to build up this market i'm i'm assuming i don't know exactly yeah. what what happened but then you have you know the influence of of all these things you know miles davis started doing more electronic stuff and you know the fusion thing kind of took off on its own and became an entity of, unto itself and I mean, shit. I, I guess it's just change, you know. Yeah. It's, I don't. I don't know if anything can really be pointed out as being the, the cause. Back to our conversation with Eric in just a moment, and I want to give a shout out to our sponsor, Upton Bass. And like I said in the intro. Eric is playing on an Upton bass travel instrument right now, which is such a practical way to get around these days. Air travel is not getting any easier for sure. And not carrying around the giant coffin trunk is a beautiful thing. Upton's been doing great things for years and years and years. I've been such a fan. They've been a longtime supporter. So thank you, thank you. And Eric Roy over at Upton, he's the one who introduced Eric Rivas and I. So that whole reason why you're hearing this interview is because of Eric over at Upton. So thanks, Upton. You guys are doing great work. Love your instruments and check them out online at UptonBass.com. All right, back to our conversation with Eric Rivas. Well, it's fascinating to me to see like the last few years and like, you know, like, like the, some of the, the solo releases you put out or like with your trio or like, I don't know if, if you know, Miles Mosley at all, but like, I find it fascinating to see like oh, yeah, what yeah. Miles is doing, like in terms of just like blending these genres and kind of, it's just like, it's almost like the, I mean, from my perspective, like the last maybe decade, decade plus, it's like, I see this like amazing creativity happening, like in the, it's like, it's the same time when like streaming, you know, is like becoming bigger and bigger. And it's like, oh, how are people making, you know, like, I don't know, right. to me, I'm seeing this like amazing creativity in the, what you might think of it, the jazz world or whatever label you want to put on it with like what well, you're up to, what Miles up to. Have you noticed, I mean, cause you've been in this business for a while, like have, have you noticed a like a change in the last few years? In 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 some ways, I have. In in other ways, I you know it's it's like in certain in certain respects, it's it's almost kind of been the opposite of it. You know, I remember yeah. uh, this was not too long, man, maybe about a few months ago. So I'm just you know you always keep your ear to the ground, and I've been doing so much stuff and and just really really particular as to what I was checking out. So I go to like the jazz thing on on uh, iTunes. And I pick out like the the top, you know, people that that I know or or kind of know, pick out like top four records, and I couldn't tell them apart. Really, <laughs> was, like everybody had the same thing. It was like this arpeggiated guitar line that starts off okay, then we're doing <laughs> grade eight thing at seven, and then it's like you know a, a melody that seems to have been constructed far after the chord changes have been laid out. You know, it mm-hmm. wasn't like uh, a, a pure so. In that respect, it's it's kind of like I think there's a certain homogeneity that's happening. Yeah. But I also totally agree with you. I think that, that people are really, you know, willing to draw on on all kinds of influences mm-hmm. and be true to themselves, regardless of what that is. And that's that's the most important thing, whether you know, like or dislike or anything like that. It's like if if you're honest with with these influences, and in, in my case, not not necessarily to to pander to those influences. That's what, you know, it's like, you know, guys are, well, man, you know, we need to, uh, we need to do like more of a, a, a hip hop jazz thing. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I mean, if, if you're in a hip hop, which, you know, is, I totally am in, in respects, but I, I think that it should, should influence me in a, more of an innate way than me going like, I'm going to put a beat on this tune. Right. And, and then, you know, it's like because then you start you start walking down that line that it's it's kind of like a, a no man's land almost like you know hip hop dudes really don't like the shit jazz people don't really like it you've you've you know so um I, I feel you yeah. know what I'm saying I, I totally do yeah it's kind of like with the hip hop thing it's kind of like when the rise of disco happened right and all of a sudden everybody had the disco beat you got the Rolling Stones it, putting the disco exactly beat, you know exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah. You know, there's some people I hear two notes and I know who they are, right? And I could hear like, I could hear like Miles, you know, he would go back, you know, or or on the bass world, like I hear Ray Brown play a couple notes and it's like, that's Ray Brown. Okay, right. And I totally put you in that category. Like you've got this sound. And, you know, when I, when I interview someone, I usually put out on my Facebook community and that sort of thing, like, hey, I'm chatting with Eric. What questions do you have? And people ask. So it's, it's really cool because right. like something that a whole bunch of people asked about was like sound. Maybe we just talk about how you think of bass sound in general. And then maybe we can get into specifics of like, you know, strings and action and all that kind of business. Well, I, you know, one, I, I think that the, the learning of, of, of jazz, in a sense, is, is counterintuitive because, as, and, you know, and when we're young, more is more. You know, it's like we're always trying to, to permutate. We're always trying to add. We've seen this through through music ads for years, like, you know, how to play faster, how to play like, you know. And when, you, and when you're 16, the shit is really, you know, yeah, you know, it's like. Nobody could tell me that Stanley Clark was not the absolute baddest bass god ever. And a lot of it was because of, of just the, the facility that he, you know, it was like. Brrrr. And as you get older and you start, you start, you know, checking out more and more stuff. It's like you realize that the, the, the counterintuitive part is that the great of, of any music can be identified by one sound. So it's actually a distillation process. You go through all this stuff and then as well, and and it becomes like, so like you said, you know, Ben Webster plays one note, Ray Brown. Wilbur Ware plays no sites. It's it's Wilbur Paul Chambers. It's like, so I I think that that sound is, um, when when I got to New York, there was a bunch of us that that came at the same time and uh, me and J.D. Allen lived together for for on and off (laughs) various times. And he was he was like one of the young cats that was really, really it's like I, I was fortunate enough to be there where everybody was really concerned with, with your sound. You know, it's like and Betty Carter would say that shit. If you have a good sound, it doesn't matter what you play. It sounds great. You know, so. So in, in terms of, of the base. Um, so I, I ended up going to school. The last school I went to uh, was University of New Orleans. I came to study with Ellis Marsalis. He had a program. Great, great program. And at that time, there were a lot of young guys in, in New Orleans. Uh, you know, Nicholas Payton, who's been here. Uh, Peter Martin, Brian Blade, Chris Thomas, Mark Turner was here. And New Orleans, as always, has been, you know, the, the music scene was very, very bright, vibrant, very active. So you ended up playing all these gigs, you know, go to class and then you would have gigs on, you know, Decatur Street. You'd have gigs on this club, but, you know, and there was no time to carry amps around or, you know, this, you, you were trying to make a gig because we're all broke. We're all, this, you know, just like, I need to want to make this. And there was a, a, a big emphasis here on, on sound. You know, like I would hear stories of, of cats like Slow Drag, Papa Joe, or Pops Foster, who, you know, of course, is uh, apocryphal at this point. But, you know, they could shake walls with their sound, you know, it's like and then that that always struck me as being being something that that is is it's, it's just kind of like, you know, in here. So I uh, that that was that was a, a, a very big part of of you know, my, my trajectory. And, and, and like just the, the thought for a lot of bass players of like getting a sound, you know, even in like a, like a small group setting without an amp, right. That can carry yeah. and penetrate and they can do that for multiple hours that like strikes fear into the hearts of so many bass players. <laughs> right. Like, it let, is. Like, like how, how uh, and I've chatted with a couple of people, I was chatting with Larry Grenadier recently about like just, pu- just sound and pulling and that sort of thing. Right. And, and it was really interesting because we, we, like another thing that a couple people mentioned when I said, hey, I'm talking to Eric, they're like, that, that pull that he gets is just tremendous. And I, I had a really fascinating conversation with Larry. I love your thoughts on this. Larry's, Larry was saying like, at a certain point, it's like, yeah, you pull and that's a big part of the sound. But in a way, if you pull, if you go nuts and pull too hard, you're almost like taking away sound from the bass oh, a yeah. little bit. You know, like, how does that work for you? A lot of trial and error. And, yeah. And- you know, because you go through that. When when I got so I got to New York in the, in like 1990, 91, somewhere around there. So there was a, a whole thing of of um that's what would hike their action up. I mean, you could you could stick up your hand in between, you know, like on the on the fingerboard. It's just like 
yo, yeah, you can definitely, definitely overpull. I mean, to compensate for that, what, what I noticed that a lot of guys that were doing it that actually were able to continue in that certain thing, it's like their, their right hand became much lighter than expected. So they're actually, you know, it's, it's almost a, a bouncing motion and they're letting the instrument speak from, from that, that point. Me personally, I, I, I do like to dig in. Yeah, yeah, you know, so but and you can't dig in if if the shit is like you know hyped up. <laughs> it's like you just fall in between. It's like oh man, did you ever read that that story about Ray Brown? He's when he came out, like all those Oscar Peterson records came out. I mean, he had been of course somewhat famous before then, but the Oscar Peterson trio records came out where where he was featured, and apparently in in Europe, all these guys heard this sound and said, man, his action must be like you know just tremendous coincidentally a lot of guys ended up really damaging themselves like hiking and then so i've heard stories of guys you know ray would come over and they're like his action is really not that you know it's yeah. not what we thought it was you know so right, right. yeah trial to trial and error you know getting down to where i i, I hate I, I really don't, don't like low action. I, I don't yeah. think the instruments, but I mean, finding that medium where the box can actually push some air out and you can, you have some, some latitude in terms of like how forceful you want to be, you know, to an extent. No, totally. I, I was chatting with a luthier recently. He had a great analogy about like action and fingerboard and everything. And he said, the fingerboards, the point where the instrument and the player interface right it's like the keyboard or something it's like where you right, interface right. it and I, I thought that was a really interesting analogy and you know it's funny like being able to see all these great artists that we used to just listen to like paul chambers and, and guys like that on youtube and you realize like oh they're not pulling as hard as maybe we thought they were right it's been, <laughs> yeah. been really educational just like going back in time and looking at and and i gotta ask because I, I, people asked to be like on your base right now like what what do you like in terms of strings i know you've been are you using some combination of gut strings or have you, or like, what, what's that look? Yeah. What's that? What do you got yeah. on your bass right now? Uh, right now I've, I've been using uh, velvet garbos for quite some time, you know, and right now it's, it's a uh, um, kind of, uh, I have the garbo on the G and right now I'm, I'm trying out these uh, Zyx, uh, the Zyx medium gauge on the E, A and D. You know, it's like I kind of always, always have to have my my G excursions <laughs> are, are definitely always D and G, you know, um, definitely always G, you know, sometimes it's D depending on on what um, I, I just I've never been able to for for the for the type of playing that I do. And, and you know, my voice is the still G. Is. And maybe it would be cool if I, if I stuck with it long enough to get past the the twain, yeah. the the over you know the the over sustained twain thing. I just never have patience for it. This just starts messing with me, man. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, you know. <laughs> so it's a, yeah, those Zyx strings are fascinating. I've been I've been experimenting with, with those myself. They're they're fascinating under the bow too. It's like I can like play a G harmonic and go get a cup of coffee and come back. And it's still, <laughs> right, it's still right, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 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 really digging them, you know, and, and it's it's uh um I also have, have played uh the, the Gerald Gensler, he made some strings for me. Really? Um, yeah. Yeah, that was uh I, I actually have a, a set of strings. He was like, you you should try these out. And this kind of goes to the kind of like the action thing, the whole, you know, because he's he's just kind of the mad scientist of gut strings. Man, he gave me the strings and I literally, literally the E string is about this thick. It's, oh man! It's, it's a rope, man. It's <laughs> like, and I want to do it, and it's just like, man, I, you know, it's like I have this, this, this like fascination with gut because I, I also feel that, you know, the, the the more organic material that that you're connecting to the wood, you know, that there is something about that, and I'm fascinated with it, man. I put those things on, and it's just like I. There's no possible way, you know, and, and some people, you know, and I've heard some guys do it, you know, especially like, like in, in broke ensembles. It sounds amazing. Yeah. Can't get to it. <laughs> it's just, it's just. <laughs> 
Well, well, that Ger- Ger- Gensler. Yeah, talk about the mad sciences of strings. I had the chance to hang out with him a little bit in Prague uh, about a year ago, and and yeah, it's like you sit down and you have a two hour conversation with him, and then he goes and makes you these top secret strings. You know that like there's this there's this Polish bass player named Simon Marciniak who's been playing on Gensler strings, and I had the chance to hear him play a couple times last month, and it's like. like I've it's I, I can pick and I know it's it's him. It's not just the strings, but man, those strings, there's something so fascinating about those strings and this guy's bass. And I mean, he's playing like all like classical solo rap, but like it sings out in a in a fascinating, beautiful, gorgeous, filling the hall cover, you know, carrying over this big orchestra like like you. And, and I heard all these other great players, but there was something about that particular sound that just like. Going back to sound, that I just found totally fascinating. Yeah, it's it's great. And the, the, the funny thing about him is like you can't. It's like I the, the the first set of strings I got from there were these kind of weird hybrid things, and man, so good, so good. It was just like perfect. I was like, wow. So I didn't get a hold of him. So that maybe you know a year and a half, two years go by. I was like, man, you know what? Fuck, I, I need some more of these strings. He's like, oh yeah, man, I'm I'm totally done with that. I don't even. Maybe you should try. And I'm like, no, wait a minute. You know, it's like he's always changing. So you know, yeah. if you if you get a hold of him, you know, just invest, I guess, a few thousand dollars. Right. In, you know, like grab as many of them as you can because it, it won't be around. You know, he's he's, he's great though. He's he's really interesting dude, man. We'll wrap up our conversation with Eric in just a moment, but I wanted to give a shout out to our other sponsor, Diderio Strings, and let you know about their Helicor strings, which come in all kinds of variants, whether you are a jazz player, classical player, or do some sort of hybrid playing in between or another style of music. D'Addario's got you covered with their Helicor strings, their pizzicato, their orchestral, and their hybrid Strings all come in light, medium, and heavy gauge strings. They also come in solo strings, so you can get whatever your needs are in terms of strings met with Diderio strings. They're all engineered, designed, and crafted at the Diderio String Factory in New York. So check them out online at Diderio.com. And thank you for sponsoring the podcast, guys. Okay, diving back in, and we're talking about traveling now with Eric. So, this is a fun topic, of course, and something that Eric does a lot of. And we get into mindset and how to get work done at any point during the day. Fascinating conversation as we wrap up here with Eric Rivas. With all the because you're traveling a lot, do you have any do you have any issues with the the climate going to you know like you're in the winter in Chicago and then you're down in Los Angeles and then down in Florida or something like that? I mean, did I, I if if it's if it's too warm, I was, you know the interesting thing is like so I'm playing the, the this Upton bass that that I've, I've been playing for a while and it has a detachable neck, so that that actually provides a whole other set of things but ironically the guts go back to pitch and sustain a lot better than than you would anticipate hmm. it's like so take taking it off like i don't I've, I've i've kind of stayed away from taking the bass everywhere like if we have a series of one, one-nighters it's mm-hmm. just you know it's it's just ridiculous you can't you know, get the bass, set it up, and, you know, you, you has to sit for like an hour or two just to, yeah. to for everything and, to, and, and night after night. Set. But if we're going to be somewhere like like here or, you know, recording or stuff like that, um, I do it. And I, I haven't had, no, I, you know, the with with the rap gut, if it's, you know, summertime and you're you're playing outdoors and you like you said, in Florida or something like that, you start you start getting the mushy, the, <laughs> the I'm drowning in a sea of floppiness type thing you know but uh um, for the most part it's 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 been good so so uh, the upton travel base when you can with the removable neck right when you when you can't when it's a longer engagement and then for these one-nighters man like talk about a you know it's one thing if you're a pianist and i mean pianists complain too it's like oh this this piano doesn't you know but that's nothing compared to like what we're talking about right with basses how do you how do you accommodate you know, when you go, 
back and forth from different cities with with uh, like one night, you know, on a different base. You you must have had some nightmare situations. Oh man, it's it's all nightmares. It's it's kind of like with anything else, you know, like you have. <laughs> this sounds kind of strange analogy, but you know, like when you have like the, the death of a loved one, and they you know, they tell you, you know, wow, you, you think you're going to get used to it, you know, or, or you know, it'll subside, and it doesn't really subside. You just get used to the feeling of it. You you know, it's it's kind of like that. You know, that that your your soul dying on stage in front of like thousands of people becomes like a you know you're okay. I'm I'm cool with it mm-hmm. <laughs> sounding like complete ass in front of like you know 3500 people and probably tomorrow it's going to be the same thing yeah um you know i i think that um it's 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 I, i've had per- particular trouble with it being that that you know of course there is no standard you get a small three quarters one night then the next night you got damn near a full-size base mm-hmm. and then you know it's this mm-hmm. strings that have actually been a little more consistent because most people you know like like spiral cords or something like that. So you, you can stay in the, the realm of that. The hardest part for me is that sometimes because I play pretty forcefully and just in terms of the energy putting into the instrument, sometimes an instrument will shit out on me. Yeah. It's like, it, it will have, you know, it's just like it, it, it goes limp and that's, that's a rough one. And then, you know, the, the E flat D neck thing, that's the one that, that gets me. So I've, I've come to taking around, the little adhesive dots that you get, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll dot up an instrument in a minute. You just, you know, it's like, I have no problem. And, and, you know, with the deep, like French basses, you know, it's like, you got to start dotting them up, you know, <laughs> like, <laughs> and, and D, you know, it's like, wait a minute, where is this? You know, it's like, Oh, you know, it's yeah. Well, and especially for some, I mean, like it's, it must be so hard to get, to get, you know, into the music, lost in the music, like you'd want to be when you're worried about the, you know, am I going to land on a D or an E flat, right? I mean, that's, that's, yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah. Even with, you know, I, it drives me nuts even borrowing a bass for like some easy orchestral gig. It's a totally, if I'm, if I'm like, try, if I'm doing something improvised or I'm trying, you know, trying to be spontaneous and I'm worrying about the gear that's got to just interfere with your flow. It, it totally does. Yeah. It, 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 um, I, um, I had, um, a record session in the south of France one time we were there for a few days and man it was so we had not only some some pretty pretty hard intricate music but now I'm dealing with a bass and and you know it's I had taped up <laughs> I was taping up everywhere and you you know you're doing this you know it's just like man this is it's such an impediment to like Sound wise, I think I've I've kind of transitioned. Like you know, I know the guys in the band are like, "No man, it sounds like even you know you get a crap bass, you can still get you know your essence out to a certain extent." But uh, it's, it's it's just really frustrating. It's it's really it's part of. I, I think it makes ultimately it makes you better. I think you get closer to your own sound when you do things like that. that. You know, when you have to, to, to exact or, or convey what you want to convey on a totally different instrument, and if you can start getting closer and closer to that, you're actually building up your your thing, you know. So it's, it's been good, It's but it's, man, it's frustrating. So it started with, because Betty Carter, she never would take a bass. Mm-hmm. And this is when everybody had coffins and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. But, you know, we were doing those Euro Pass tours where it's like, you know, 10 hours on the train, two-hour sound check gig eat you know end up at the hotel at two or three o'clock in the morning four or five o'clock pick up and you know so that would that wasn't going to happen so man with being on the road like you and then like the just the variances in the schedule you know like li- living in los angeles but then you're down recording an album and then you did like what do you do and again super wide questions so but like what do you do to, to like keep from going insane stay grounded you know not just like like you know i talk to people that play broadway shows and they're out for a year and like some people find a routine and a groove and they're totally with it some people they just turn into like a basket case and they, they you know they're just like <laughs> party till four and then can't do, you know, like, what do you, do you have any routines or, or, or rituals or anything that you do to just keep your life together when you're, when you're doing as much traveling as you're doing? No, I, I think that, that once you relinquish the, the idea of having a body clock, mm. once, <laughs> once, once you, if, if you let that, truly let it go, 
things start becoming a little easier. You know, it's like, okay, well, it used to, it used to just totally mess with me. Like, you, you're, if you've flown to Europe and you have, like, a couple days, you're, you're, you think you're acclimating, and then all of a sudden, no matter what time you go to bed, you're waking up at, like, 2.30 in the morning. And you're up. I mean, up, up, you know. And then, and basically, you start working against yourself. It's like, oh, shit, I got to get some sleep. This is going to be crazy. I'm going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then that that feeds a whole other thing, and then you're... Now it's just like I wake up at 2.30 in the morning. It's like, cool, you know, read, check out some music, whatever. Just let it go. And it's been over the past few years, it's been a lot better. In terms of routine, I mean, if I, if I have um, an instrument, then then it's, it's you know, this is a great practice time. You've got, you know, the day barring, you know, like having to wash some clothes or eat. You know, you you have your schedule. It's 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 really good. I love that concept of rel- relinquishing the idea of having a body clock. I was talking to Ruben Rogers about a year ago, and he was talking about, you know, like traveling and like, yeah, it's like you wake up at 3 a.m. and you're just like full of energy. It's like, well, what can you do at 3 a.m.? Well, you can answer right. some emails or you can do this or that and like seize that productivity. Um, when you have the base, like when you, and you do get some time to get some practicing and like, what does that time look like for you these days? Do you have like a routine? Like I know Ray Brown used to like play Arco scales every day, whatever, you know, do, do you have anything you do consistently or does it change depending on what's going on in your life? It, 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 it changes, but yeah. it, it's, it's, it's pretty consistent. There, there are variations within the few camps. You know, there's, there's all kinds of like long tone scale work type stuff. And, you know, that can take an hour or two to go through all the stuff. Uh, Pierre Bosiquet, the great French bass player, he, I, I got to hang out with him years and years ago. And he's, he kind of got, got me in. And this is common knowledge, but he's the first one to, to, to really get me into it. And, you know, like taking scale work, even, even just, just scales, long tone scales, but playing them through the cycle of force or the cycle of fists. That way you, you're able to touch all the, the whole bass by the time you're done. So, you know, I do that. Um, there's always some things that, that I'm working on personally. There's something that's that's actually, and, and I never thought it would, uh, I would be one of these cats, but, you know, they have the um, the real book the app. Yeah, thing. yeah. And you can, you can, you know, you put it on and it'll play, you know, up to 24 chords as well. I mean, that shit is great. You're sitting in a room. It's like, let me go through. And, and you know, work on things like that. There's also you know harmonic things. I'm, I'm JD Allen and and Bill McHenry, and there's always we always have this floor change of ideas. And so there's always kind of like new perspective information coming in. Like, yo, man, check this out. What you know, you know, man, I just man, Sonny did this on this. Let me check it. Out. Oh, damn, what is this? You know, and then you know you're able to apply it. During, so it's it's like all these things. If it's um, it's best when when I'm say like with this being with Branford so long, yeah, but, you know, today I'm going to get off and, and I'm going to tackle this music for this record because it's, it's a lot of it. Uh, so yeah, that's yeah. it. But, you know, it, it, being being that, that we know what we're going to do and we have, a, you know, a, a body of work, you can you can actually work on other things and, and then try to, you know, incorporate them in a very familiar fashion. So it's it's, it's a bunch of stuff. It's, it's always kind of changing, but it's always like with, within those groups, you know, like, like some scale long tones you know harmonic shit you know yeah, yeah yeah well it's great to hear and people and all those students out there that listen to this they're like look what you're doing and where you are in your career and you're still practicing your long tones you know breaking oh, up yeah, the face. Oh, totally, good. Totally. yeah yeah that's that's you know that, that's that's the zen work <laughs> Well, man, I appreciate you taking the tie. This is this is like I, I, I'm so glad that that Eric uh, over at Upton connected us. And yeah, definitely, um, man. You know, definitely. if I, I usually end with some sort of you know like advice for young folks out there, but you know, but what I usually ask people and taking whatever direction you want is like if you could go back and talk to like young Eric, like starting at in New Orleans, starting to study with. Ellis Marcellus, like you've done so much since then. Like, what advice would you give young Eric, you know, <laughs> at this point in your career? Wow, they, man, it, you know, it's like <laughs> at first I was kind of, I don't, there's so much stuff. Um, I think patience. I mm-hmm. think realizing that that anything that that you're working on, patience. You know, we work on we work on some things, and it could be anything. It could be you know, like a, a, a certain Boeing. Um, any and we want it 
to manifest itself immediately. Mm -hmm. If you keep in mind that what you're working on today will come in at least probably about six months. Yeah. You know, and having the patient and, and not, not, you know, realizing that the process of attaining this information is far more important than the actual, like doing it, you know, like falling in love with the process. And then I would go in and although when I was here, you know, I, I had started checking out, but yeah, to check out Louis Armstrong, Pete Briggs, Bill Johnson, you know, get, get to that, to that quick. Eric, so great to chat with you. And folks, check him out online at ericrevis.com. And Eric and I were chatting while he was in New Orleans recording a new album with Branford Marcellus. So be sure to check that out when that drops. And everything he's done, I mean, what a fantastic artist. Been active for the last couple of decades and just continuing to do great things in the world of music, in the world of jazz, in the world of the double bass. And thank you for joining us. If this is... Contrabass Conversations, episode number one for you. Welcome. We have 431, I think, other episodes you can check out. And if you're into jazz in particular, you can go to our website, ContrabassConversations.com, and put in slash jazz. So that's ContrabassConversations.com slash jazz, and that will redirect you to every jazz-related episode. So you can check out the likes of Ron Carter, Gary Peacock, Larry Grenadier, that's just naming a few and many more of course jazz related interviews coming up in the future thank you for tuning in i totally appreciate it as we wrap up here in 2017 if you're listening to this now or maybe sometime in the future that's that's where we are you can check out our app, which we continue to update and develop, and that is at ContrabassConversations.com slash app. It's a great way to search through all the content. And if you aren't on the email list, I would love to have you on there. I realize I almost never mention it here on the podcast, but it's a great way to keep in touch and continue the conversation between the podcast episodes. And I respond to each and every message I get. I'd love to have you on there, and I'd love to hear from you you, by the way, too. Feedback at ContrabassConversations.com will put you in touch with me. I get emails every day from people that listen to the podcast, and it just makes me so happy, and it gives me ideas for how to shape the show going forward. You'd you'd think I know what I'm doing at episode 432. Not so. I'm still working on it. I still feel like I'm a beginner. I'm at the very beginning of a long journey with this, so I'm right there with you, learning and growing, hopefully, with these episodes and taking away tidbits and skills and tactics and that kind of thing that I can use in my own music making and other areas of life. So thank you again for tuning in and we will see you again soon for more life on the low end of the spectrum. (laughs) 